I guess all of us in this room share the same vision of bringing new innovation to improve or even prolong the lives of patients or people with severe diseases. With Spark and Medical, we, we are pursuing this in two ways. First, we want to improve precision in medical imaging in a way that will allow better treatment of patients with, for instance, breast cancer or endometriosis. Secondly, and perhaps more important, we are pursuing a radio, new radiopharmaceutical that can expand the scope of radiopharmaceuticals and effective radiotherapy to patients with severe cancer. Right now, we are, we are very much focused on, on cancer that uh, affects women, uh, like breast cancer, and, and we are very interested in ovarian cancer. We are also, with our imaging project, looking into endometriosis, uh, which is a disease with a very, very high need of new diagnostics and a disease that affects millions of win women worldwide. And the results we have got with, with our Spogapix program, our imaging program, shows that we have a technology that allows us to accumulate our nanomaterial selectively in tumor lesions and perhaps also in endometrial lesions. And I'm very, very happy to stand here today and say that we have just got approval to start our first clinical trial with Tumorad, our uh, radiopharmaceutical program in Australia, uh, which is a huge milestone for, for Spaga Nanomedical that now has one project in clinic in diagnostics and one in therapeutics. So for this presentation, I'm going to focus quite a lot on, on Tumorad. And what makes Tumorad unique is the ability to target several types of cancers. The radiopharmaceuticals today that are approved or in late stage pipeline are all directed towards a single type of cancer by means of their targeting mechanisms. What we want to do is to broaden that scope. So if we look into the mechanism by which uh, Tumorad accumulates in, in tumors, I will come back to this in a second as well, we can see that there are several tumor types that could be targetable by this, by this pharmaceutical, like colorectal, like breast cancer, uh, gastric, and ovarian. And it's important to say that with, with breast cancer, we already generated imaging data that shows that we can selectively accumulate uh, in the breast cancer uh, tumors. We do recognize that ovarian cancer is a is an indication of huge medical need. There, there are few treatment opportunities. It's a devastating disease. And we do think that there are good reasons to go with that indication for, for Tumorad as well. So we see that Tumorad has, has a, uh, pro can, can provide a treatment opportunity, both as a monotherapy, but also in combinations with existing uh, therapies. So how do we do this? Well, we, are, we have developed a, an optimized platform uh, of polymeric nanoparticles that are very safe in the human body and that can accumulate selectively in the tumors. This sounds easy. I can tell you it's not. It has taken quite some time to get where we are today. Uh, and what we found out during the, the uh, development of the imaging project is that these, this material has the ability to bind in a very, very, very tight way and a very stable way clinically proven radioisotopes, which means that we can use this material as a radiopharmaceutical. So what we have and what we ended up with, and we just communicated the other day that we, we are now uh, expanding the, the patent protection of, of, uh, of this program, is truly a unique and first-in-class compound uh, that can provide the potential uh, for treatment with clinically effective radioisotopes of a broader population of patients. 
So we've come a good way with this, and as I said, we've proven that we can, can uh, visualize selectively breast cancer. Uh, we have proven in the animals that we can see also tumors there of different kinds. Uh, we have preclinical data that supports clinical translation, both in terms of safety and regula regulatory studies. Uh, and of course, we have survival data that shows that we can prolong the life of, of, uh, of animals with cancer. So all of this leads up to the first clinical trial with Tumorad, which I'm extremely happy to say that we are now starting in Australia. It's a phase 1-2A trial in cancer patients with the aim of obviously documenting initial safety and, and uh, escalating doses. More importantly, during the phase one, since this is a radiopharmaceutical, we have the ability to trace it within the body and through the body, which means that at the quite early stage, we will be able to predict the potential to reach a, a favorable benefit-risk profile with this compound. So that's a very important milestone that, that we hope that we'll be able to, to reach during the first half of next year. Uh, and running the study in Australia, just commenting on that, which may, may, as it may seem a bit strange to go all across the, the world, uh, they have a very beneficial uh, reimbursement system there for R&D costs, which means that we can get back approximately 43% of, of what we pay there for, for doing the trial. So it's a very cost-effective way of doing a clinical trial. So just, just to round up, uh, we are now clinical stage with two legs, diagnostics and therapeutics. We have a unique platform, uh, very strongly patented by us. Uh, the imaging program provides clinical validation of the technology, so reducing the risk. Uh, and obviously the clinical translation of Tumorad, the radiopharmaceutical, now allow us to get to meaningful data at, at an early stage, which, which will be very interesting to see, and, and a potential value uh, increase infliction point uh, next year. So we see a lot of things happening in the, in the near term, and it, it's very exciting. So I will stop there and uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, again, you're popular here. Uh, can, uh, the first question is if tumor can be considered a personalized therapy. Well, uh, in a way it can, as, as all radiopharmaceuticals, as they can be traced with, with different imaging technologies like SPECT or, or planar imaging, uh, things like that. You could imagine giving a small dose first and then so, see, seeing where it ends up and then treat the patient afterwards. That's not the, the, the route we are taking right now because we think there may be difficulties uh, delaying treatment in these often very severely sick patients. So, so uh, uh, th there are different ways of going there. Right now we, we do not, we see it as, as a general treatment. And someone else, also called Anonymous, uh, would like to know, um, Radio Pharma is so hot, I assume in the colloquial sense here. Uh, are there many recent deals and M&As going on in this area? Oh yes, very, very much so. And, and just uh, the past months, uh, there has been some really big deals. Eli Lilly bought Point Biopharma, for instance, for $1.4 billion uh, just a couple of weeks ago. There have been others. There have been a series of, of uh, IPOs and, and uh, investments, uh, mainly in the U.S., of course. Uh, but, but we see that both on the investment side and on big pharma side, there is definitely an increasing interest in this field. Yeah, we also have a question about that, I guess, then ties in a little bit to the competitive landscape, that how does your candidate compare in its ability to target the tumors? How does it compare to similar drugs? Well, I mean, the, there aren't much similarity in the sense that we are, we are utilizing a physiological targeting mechanism ra rather than a molecular targeting mechanism. So 
what we see, the, the agents that are approved today are based on peptides or antibodies or, and, and also in the late stage pipeline, that's what we typically see. Uh, our particles have a more, let's say, physiological or passive way of, of targeting the tumor, so there, there are differences. And the point here is that really Tumorad has the potential to, to go for other cancers that cannot be targeted today by molecular means. And then we have a rather, well, from my point of view, rather technical question that the isotope uh, 177LU, if that's how you pronounce it, that you are using, has that been used in other radiopharmaceuticals? It has, yes. It's definitely clinically validated. It's been used by, uh, by Novartis, for instance, in their approved drugs Lutathera and, and Pluvicto, uh, which are now, I believe, at least nearing blockbuster status. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely proven. It's, it's a beta radiator. Now I'm, I'm too getting technical here. It's, it, it's a beta uh, radiator, uh, so it's shooting away electrons that uh, break DNA strands. And uh, yeah, I mean, radio radioactivity has been known for hundreds of years to be effective to treat cancer. The trick or the difficulty is to get it in the right dose uh, to the right uh, sites in, in the body. Uh, and that's what we are seeing now. Someone is also asking about the uh, endometriosis area, which is your latest venture, so to speak. And if it binds to the endometriosis cells, will it affect the treatment of endometriosis? Well, it, it doesn't bind, and that, that's the thing here. We are not binding anything to anything. Uh, we, we are accumulating our particles in the lesions, and it's the, it, the same goes for endometriosis, which is an inflammatory lesion that shares a lot of similar similarities to tumors. And we are right now we are evaluating the images coming out of our phase 2A trial in endometriosis patient. Uh, it, it looks promising, but we don't have the final data yet. Uh, but what we aim to do there is to, to as I said initially, we want to make, uh, accomplish a better precision in the imaging of these women. Uh, that usually, I mean, diagnosis of endometriosis, I think that the mean time is seven years or something like yeah. that. Uh, and, and treatments are uh, not very precise. It's hormonals and painkillers and, and sometimes surgery. So we, what we want to do is to, to aid the diagnosis and also probably aid the surgery of these patients to be more precise. You mentioned you don't have the final data there yet. When do you expect to have the...? The analysis is ongoing, so we, we expect to communicate something before year end, end on that. And as a final question, then you, you uh, highlighted here the advantages of, of using Australia for your clinical trials. Will you, will you be going to Australia or how do you manage <laughs> the... Uh, I wish. How do you manage on the ground? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we have a lot of people, uh, good people on the ground in Australia. Uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, and we have a, our, a very competent and good uh, chief development officer here as well, who is managing the trial in an excellent way. Uh, he will probably go there. So Paul will go to Australia. He will probably <laughs> go there, lucky him, but uh, not I. <laughs> Well, okay, so Paul's the lucky one, and I guess you're lucky in the sense that the presentation and the Q&A is now over. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you much.